Welcome to the Transportation Committee meeting of Wednesday, the 28th of February, 2018. I'm Mike Bonham, the chair, uh, joined by Nuri Martinez. Uh, Mr. Kretz should be here shortly. Uh, I'm going to start the meeting uh, with uh, a warning to uh, Mr. Herman and Mr. Spindler. Uh, this is your first and only warning. Uh, and if there's any disruptions, you'll be asked to leave immediately. Uh, so uh, I am going to uh, begin by recommending that um, items 2, 3, 4, and 5 be approved on consent. Any objection? No. All right, so that's the order of the committee, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, oh, before I do that, yes, we have the uh, general ca cards. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Herman and Mr. Spindler. Two minutes on multiple cards and one minute on general public comment. this morning my disability I'll, I'll be the first one you know ever since my medication has been restricted I, I have memory problems but this is one issue I can't remember it says item 7 Mr. Bonin and Mr. Weezer and the little fat pig <laughs> Peppa Caretz for updating implementing city transportation commands to measure the integrating of TDM, whatever the fuck that means, but also refer to planning loose management. Is that the same planning and land use management that was in the news regarding corruption? Donation corruption? I'm not sure, but okay, fuck it. Let me go to the next one. The tyrant Herman West and Jason on item nine, talking about Baldwin Hills. Oh, I think West Vernon Avenue off of South La Brea should not realistically have evaluations for the forthcoming Metro Crenshaw light rail station because our, our infrastructure is so poorly and inadequate for the safety of our children. I, I can't see myself with my disabled dog sitting there fearing that some fucking nigger is going to pull a knife Mr. out of Mr. Herman. Yeah? Mr. Herman, I'm going to interrupt for a second. You are, you are completely within your First Amendment rights to say whatever you want, I as much as we find it objectionable. There are fucking... young children in this room, and I would ask this you, although you have the right to say whatever you want, Bonin. to be mindful of the fact that Mr. there are young Bonin. children in this room who do not need to be subjected to hearing that word. I've been exposed to many things, and you're interrupting my First Amendment. I, I, I never venture off of what is off topic unless I truly believe I'm wrong. But you're on a line demanding that I not stop using what? Intensifiers? You're being unreasonable, Mr. Bonin. I'm a public speaker and I don't like to be threatened. I don't like to be bullied. Because you know what? Back in the days when Moses was taking the Israelites away from the tyrant king? You think like a king, because you tried to suppress me. You're off me. topic, Mr. Herman. Well, let me go Get back on, on topic. topic. Yes, Get yes. on the agenda. Oh, fuck you. Let me finish now. In my closing argument, people like you shouldn't be involved with development, because development interrupts transportation. When two go hand in hand and you're being paid by development, it interrupts my transportation because now I have to spend more money to pay for transportation and public use of that transportation because you've been paid off by developers and under HHH, it's a bitch. <laughs> oh, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Now we turn to item number one with the skinhead. Yes, Harris Dawson, to the establishment of an oversized fucked up vehicle registration district. So for people that understand, when you lose your home and you live in a mobile home, these fat fucking racist cocksuckers are going to make you move your car 
by having it over 22 feet long and 7 feet high. You know why they do that? Because most mobile homes built after 1996 are longer than 20 feet. Racist. So now we get to number two, CD3. That's Bob the chicken head. He's doing the same thing. And then we go to item three. And that's the CD6. And these are big ass vehicle restrictions in the big ass district. So when you have a big ass, you cannot park your big ass car on the fucking streets of Van Nuys. And that's what they're doing. Number four, policies for parking meters. Fuck parking meters. We don't need parking meters. Parking meters are trash, and the people that empty them are trash, and the people that pay are victims. So we don't want to charge for parking, free parking for everybody, especially people in downtown LA. Then number five, vendor name. We're going to change the vendor name from local solutions to condom state. And I think that's appropriate because they fuck you, so it should be called a condom state. And I fully support item number five. Number six, LA dot. I don't even know what a dot is. Vision zero. You know what these assholes did? They put bike lanes in D and F graded streets so you would, be you would bike and break your neck. Punitive damages. The Bain Act 52.1. But this dumb fuck over here, Bonin, he decided to do it anyway. He goes, well, you know, I'm from the west side and I'm gay, so I won't get sued. So let the city get sued. Right, city attorney? Right. That's right. No, vision zero is vision bullshit. Then we get to item nine and volume metro Crenshaw light rail. Stop calling riders on the Metro Crenshaw line niggers. We really don't like that. We don't like being called niggers. Not everybody's black. Just because you ride a subway, you're not a nigger. That's not the appropriate term. The appropriate term is rider, not nigger. Nigger rider, quasi nigger, but not nigger. Fun time is out. I oppose it. Thank you so much. To the members of the public who are having your first experience with a city council committee, please let me both apologize and explain. The city has been required by the federal courts to allow people like Mr. Herman and Mr. Spindler to come here and use that language. Uh, that is the ruling of the courts. Uh, it is... Uh, deeply upsetting to us, and I know it is deeply upsetting to those of you in the audience. Uh, I apologize that you have been subjected to it. We live with it every single day in every committee meeting we go to. The fact that you have to hear that word at all, let alone in a government chamber, let alone that they did it knowing there was a young child in the room, is absolutely reprehensible. Mr. Spindler, please leave the room. Mr. Spindler. Again, our apologies that you were subjected to that. Uh, and if um, any of you know the family of the young girl who was here a few minutes ago, uh, please extend our condolences and regrets that she had to hear that and experience that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, further, ma'am? 
Uh, Ma'am, if um, if your, your your daughter, your granddaughter, your child uh, would like to come back to City Hall sometime and get a tour of the building and have a different experience here, we would be more than happy to make sure that, that opportunity was afforded Mr. to her. Mr. Chair, can I say something? Yes, because please. I think we often think we don't have a voice, and we do. If you are highly offended by the language of these individuals, then you should let us know that. Just sitting here and saying that we are unhappy or disgusted by these less than human beings that, were, that just left the room, we should put our concerns in writing and we should mm -hmm. not allow these people to beat us in court every single time. So I'm not asking you to do anything, I'm just giving you a suggestion. Because if I had a child in this room who was just subjected to that trash, I would put my concerns in writing. That's all I want to say. As a mom, I think we have a right to do that in an obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I'll co-sign the letter. <sighs> Uh, so, uh, we're recommending on consent items 2, 3, 4, and 5, without objection, that's the direction of the committee. Uh, I'm going to go to item number 1. Item number 1 is a Harris-Dawson Englander resolution relative to the establishment of an oversized vehicle restricted streets for certain streets in Council District 8. Uh, we have a uh, number of public speaker cards here, uh, and I'd like to afford... Uh, the residents of CD8 an opportunity to come up and testify. Uh, Chandra Mosley, Sandra Williams, uh, and I have um, a, a card for somebody named Henderson. And that'll be uh, followed by G. Green and Val Boyd. I think we only have four seats up here at the time, so. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon. Trying to catch my breath after that episode. My name is Chandra Mosley. I am a uh, retired city employee. And as far as I've been in chambers many times, first I've ever heard anything such as that. But uh, I'm also the president of the View Heights Block Club. And so we have had an influx of large trucks parking within a neighborhood and also on Slauson. Uh, not just trucks, but RVs, campers, school buses, and um, uh, parking on Slauson in particular. And then we have trucks that are um, well over seven feet tall, 22 feet uh, long that parks within a neighborhood. Our issue is safety. Safety is huge. Uh, not only are the trucks blocking the view of drivers that's going back and forth, but our children that play in the neighborhood cannot be seen. They usually can't be seen by, um, they usually can't be seen by uh, regular sedans, but also because the trucks are so large. We also have a uh, discard of a lot of trash and uh, bulky items, uh, mattresses and things of that sort, and also uh, needles and, and things of that sort that can be walked on on a sidewalk and cause obviously a health hazard and, and disease and, and even death. So we are desperately trying to get uh, heard and recommended for the signs to be placed up. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead, ma'am. My name is Sandra Williams, and I can actually speak to the experiences that I have. Across the street, there is a house where they actually have a trucking service, and it's those big, huge ones that they park in front of their house and on the side. So in order for us to walk even past the corner, because there's no stop sign there, we have to walk literally into the street, look around to see if a car is coming before we can actually cross the street. They did have a dog that was hit and killed on that same street, but they do this every single day. Sometimes the trucks don't start, so we hear this <laughs> all morning, they will rent a U-Haul to come and transfer uh, furniture, whatever it is, to another vehicle in front. This happens every single day. You can't see on the side, the street that's going south and north, and they don't have a stop sign. The streets that are east and west have stop signs. However, if you can't see around to see if a car is coming, there's going to be a collision right there. And I experience this every single day for years. This morning they were doing the same thing. They were transferring furniture from one uh, truck 
to another truck because one of their trucks failed. And they do all of this out of their house and nobody stops them. And we've complained for years. Thank you. They are a moving company, but they are not saying that they're a moving company. And they have, one of them has mentioned that they have contracts. They go down to the docks sometimes to pick up stuff, deliver it to others. So it's technically they're using their house as a moving company. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman. My name is Mary Henderson, and I have been living in, uh, in, in my area for 47 years. And to give you an honest answer, this is the worst. Uh, the trucks coming, I live on 59th Place, cross 59th Place, and Verdon is my cross street. If I am coming down 59th Place, there is trucks parked on the, the, the east and the both sides, the left and the right of 59th Place, going crossing Verdon. I have to go out, and when I'm driving, I have to go out in the street and to, in order to see that a car is not coming down Verdun. I pray God every day that nothing happens because you cannot see when those trucks are parked there. So I am asking, please try to do something before somebody get hurt. I wouldn't want to see that happen. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Geneva Green, and I stand before you uh, with the same concerns of vehicles, large vehicles being parked in the neighborhood. My expression is always, are we going to wait for the horses to get out of the barn before we lock the gate? Is that what we're waiting for? Certainly, we don't want anyone to be hurt. Vehicles parked and you're driving by and you can't see because of you're at the stop sign. I can share with you that I volunteer for the Los Angeles Police Department. And I tell you that our officers have done as much as they can, but we need something else in place that will take care of this. I say to all of you, how would you want for your parents to be coming to visit me and make a turn and a car hit and kill them? The horses are now out of the barn. Are you ready to lock the gate? So we need to get a resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, we've got some more speakers. So if, uh, Val Boyd. Thank you so much Thank for you your very time. Much. Thank you. And then uh, I believe there's a representative from LAPD after Ms. Boyd. Please come on up. Hello, Councilman. Um, this is my first time, but um, I've been a longtime member at Grace Church. I am, my name again is Val Boyd from Grace United Methodist Church, which has been about 50 years that we've been uh, providing service to the community. So we are at the corner of Verdun and Slauson, where from the time that I've been there, it's been a you know, a beautiful place. We try to keep it clean on both sides, ours and across the street. Um, but within the last year or so, I have seen the debris, the campers and the debris left over from the mattresses and stuff that we've had to call people to come pick up. And I've been working with the youth all these years. So to come um, to the church in the mornings and find that type of activity has been going on is just not good for our community. So we're here to ask for your support in bettering our community. Again, the church is there to provide spirituality and uh, hope and anything that they need. So we, we want to help find a place for everybody to do their part and to grow in a, in a, in a better way. So again, I've, I've been a witness to the... Uh, the way we've been going down, and we want to better it. We've been renovating our church campus as well, and again, spiritually, we could provide classes and workshops and stuff. So we want to invite the, the families, the young people, and grow in a better way. So we ask and we think that this resolution will help as a starting point to um, uh, decrease some of that negative activity that we find going on. 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Hello, I'm Officer Dixon, and I'm the senior lead in the area. And over the few years, it has on Slauson, uh, across the street from our church, it has been an uprising. A lot of the uh, mobile homes been parking there, and we try to do our best and try to move them, but we have to use uh, different tow uh, uh, service, which sometimes would be six hours. Sometimes you have to make an appointment for them to remove them, and sometimes we just can't get them removed. And because of that, one parks there, and then it's just like a domino effect. People think it's a safe haven. They start parking there, and then all the trash build up, and it's, it's, it's unsightly on Slauson now. And it has become a problem, so restricted parking would, would do some good as far as uh, Slauson is involved. And on 59th and Verdun, absolutely, with everyone testified, it is a hazard. Coming out uh, the house next door, you can't see it's blind. It's a total blind spot. You can't even see the stop sign. So restricting parking on uh, 59th and Verdun and around the area that they're requesting would absolutely help with the problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. And uh, representatives from uh, Mr. Harris Dawson is recommending a thumbs up, yes? Okay. How do you say that's a go? All right. Uh, so uh, I'll take that as a motion to approve. Uh, you second? Yes. Yes. Mr. Caress seconds. Uh, unanimous recommendation of the committee is to approve this item and move it forth to council as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for coming down. Uh, that brings us to, I'm going to go to item number nine, and I believe there is a, a substitute motion or a technical correction. Yeah, the item number nine is a Wesson uh, Harris Dawson Price motion relative to instructing DOT to conduct a neighborhood traffic study um, in the area identified in the title here. Um, I would recommend that you approve it as amended to reflect the technical uh, corrections requested by Council District 10, and uh, that uh, new language has been provided to the clerk. Any objection? No. All right, without any objection, that's the recommendation of the committee. Okay, uh, that brings us to uh, item number seven. Item number seven is a Bon and Weezer Caretz motion relative to updating and implementing the city's transportation demand management measures and integrating the TDM with Mobility Plan 2035 and related matters. Okay. Do we, we, we had a public comment card on this before, didn't we? Yes, there you are. I thought, I thought I saw your name. Come on up, Michelle. She's been here all day. Been here all day. I you spoke in the morning. I did. I did. Yes. It's a busy day for us today. Uh, I can go? Yes, you, please. Uh, good morning. And to our very appreciated representative, Mr. Bonin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Bisnoff. I'm vice chair of the Brentwood Community Council. As we move forward on the um, mobility plan 2035, we have one quick concern, which is a technology glitch that we found in that plan that it would apply to all council districts, which is that as we uh, start collecting more data and implementing smart city innovations under this plan, uh, we will be increasingly dependent upon the county's uh, back end systems which are, which are run under a specific contract. I just want to make sure that all council members take a look at Mobility 2035 as they move forward to ensure that specifically, this is a little tech wonky, that all of you have access to the external interface of the county system so that if, if you do want to inter implement something or pilot something that's a smart city innovation in your area, you'll have free access to that. That's all. Thank you. We're grateful for technical and wonky compared to how we had to start the meeting. So thank you. Uh, staff, uh, want to come up? Great. So just by way of uh, introduction to this motion, it, it's actually appropriate that uh, Michelle is here from the Brentwood Community Council. Uh, part of the, the genesis of this came from a big uh, traffic charade I held in Brentwood about uh, two years ago, uh, I guess, where we discussed uh, solutions big and small to traffic congestions in Los Angeles. And uh, some of them were small infrastructure fixes, a, a, a right turn fix here, or uh, a, um, a lane reconfiguration there. But then some of them were big. And one of the things that, that folks talked about uh, was the importance, it was a wonky meeting, of transportation demand management, or mobility management, as I like to refer to it, uh, and uh, making sure that we're using technology, that we're updating um, our incentives uh, for people and the information we give people in order to give them different choices to make uh, for mobility. The thing that was particularly inspiring to me when we held this charrette was 
Uh, we had a presentation uh, about uh, what has happened in Mr. Koretz's district over the past couple decades at UCLA, uh, where the number of people visiting uh, that, uh, that, that campus have, has dramatically increased over the years, but the number of trips to, to that campus has actually decreased at the same time. Uh, from what I understand, only 54% of the students, faculty, and staff come to campus every day. Uh, by driving alone, uh, and that's compared to 73% countywide. Uh, and there are some lessons to be learned uh, from UCLA, even from some of the own standards we have here uh, for our own employees. But uh, Mr. Wiesauer and I and Mr. Koretz wanted to make sure we started updating our TDM ordinances, which I believe haven't been updated since the 90s. Yeah, so uh, it's time to update that. So you guys were thinking about doing this anyway. You've already started doing some work. This is to sort of officially kick it off and uh, let you know both uh, Plum and Transportation Committee are, are eager to see it. Uh, anything you want to tell us about uh, uh, how you're going to start, what your process is going to be? Sure. Um, hi, this is Karina Macias from the Department of Transportation. And I'll just kick things off by kind of describing what transportation demand management is. And uh, you just you gave a very... Uh, brief summary but great explanation the, and it refers to the application of strategies and programs that maximize people's choices uh, and in t existing TDM in our city is largely a result of air quality management district regulations uh, which aim to reduce drive alone commute trips uh, to large employment sites to improve air quality uh, so companies that are subject to these uh, employee commute reduction requirements uh, must maintain an on-site uh, employee transportation coordinator who is responsible for disseminating information on what employees' different options are uh, to get to work and at times operate programs to incentivize uh, employees to use these shared modes and periodically monitor and report how many people regularly, regularly drive alone to work and UCLA is an example of those employers. In some areas, transportation management organizations offer employers uh, monitoring and marketing services for a fee. For instance, in the, the Playa Vista community developer, uh, Brookfield Residential contracts with Urban Trans and Right Amigos to operate the Compass at Playa Vista Transportation Management Organization, which offers employees at the Playa Vista campus with individualized trip planning, carpool and van pool coordination, and incentives for not driving alone to work. And i just like to add um, a little bit about why we're looking at updating the your ordinance name. now. And your name? Oh, sure. Um, my name is Rubina Gazarian. I'm with the Department of City Planning. Um, and I think, um, Council Member, you did a great job of explaining that this, is, this dates back to 1993. So at this point, it's 25 years old. Um, the, the ordinance didn't, it, it's long overdue. An update is long overdue. Um, it did not at the time account for on-demand or shared mobility services that have changed people's travels, travel behavior. Um, and transportation options in the city have tremendously evolved um, over this time. We now have an expansive and growing rail system. Uh, we have uh, services that are fingertips that couldn't even be imagined in 1993. Um, so an update to this ordinance uh, that incorporates mobility management techniques and um, measures would allow the city to influence the, the marketplace, the mobility marketplace, and it would allow, uh, create opportunities to determine monitoring and evaluation um, of projects, as well as to sync up with regional and statewide efforts. So um, in October 2017, Metro adopted a board motion um, that it will elevate the role of TDM countywide. Um, at, at the same time, the state has been, over the past couple of years, um, now we have guidelines to require cities to implement Senate Bill 743. So by updating our TDM ordinance, we would align with both of those efforts um, so that TDM doesn't just uh, take place or take, take shape through CEQA, but rather more holistically citywide. And then some of our, some of our next steps and um, what we, uh, how we plan to conduct outreach and engagement. Um, and in July, we were actually back here at the Transportation Committee, and we were asked to coordinate some of our efforts with SB 743 implementation with TDM. So since then, we've been conducting a lot of background research and analysis um, and coordinating with our Technical Advisory Committee on um, getting those, um, on uh, incorporating best practices from cities across the nation. 
Uh, and in the spring, we will um, continue our public engagement with community councils and organizations and interested parties, including residents, business associations, and more. And a draft ordinance will be uh, created and shared with the public in the coming months. Um, th throughout this process, the city will continue to coordinate with Metro and other cities in the region that are also working on TDM, ordin TDM ordinances or SB 743 implementation. And this update um, will also be accompanied by some targeted code amendments, which um, help to clarify the waiver of dedication improvement process, um, or that section of the code. Um, this was, that section was updated in, in early 2017, but a proposed update um, this time around would help to enable the city to require new developments that meet certain project triggers to provide street trees, and if the project falls along a streetscape plan, to implement um, some streetscape plan improvements. Um, so the code amendment would also define new administrative procedures, um, processes for development projects seeking to waive and or appeal their requirements. Um, and these updates are aligned with the original intent of the ordinance, but would seek to clarify some of those administrative or procedural processes. And what's our timeline? Um, we're seeking to... 45 days, okay. <laughs> yeah. We'd have to do the 60-day comment period for... for I, I was joking, David. <laughs> I was totally joking. Now, what, what, what is the time? I know there's various steps. There's community input. I mean, th this is not an overnight process. I was, no, I was um, we're embarking on a community outreach process. Um, so we'll be going to the Alliance of Neighborhood Councils, Plan Check, mm -hmm. and... Um, working with business community and stakeholders, interested parties. So uh, we expect to start that process or continue that process in April, May, um, and we'll have more of an update as we start that process. I think it's yeah, it, it, it would be great to have, this is not an easy process, mm -hmm. and, but it would be great to have an actual timeline. You know, is it going to be, you know, is it a nine-month process? Is it an 18-month process? Just so we know, not just what the the horizon might be for it but what the 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 benchmarks are and so this committee and plum can get an update at a couple points along the way sure okay that'd be great mr Kretz. thank you mr chair so uh have vision zero principles been included in the traffic plan or will they be um so the in our initial background research um we've been looking at a lot of the um, uh, what other cities have implemented. Those cities include places like Cambridge, Austin, San Francisco, Santa Monica locally, um, and looking at the effectiveness of a lot of the measures to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips um, as one um, major goal of TDM. So we're looking at measures that help to meet that goal. And they're, they're vast, um, they're broad. I think it includes... Uh, just off the top of my head, a number of things, including car share, carpool, van pool, um, a lot of the measures that we see um, employment, large employment centers using today under AQMD uh, regulations, so like return trip home or, um, I guess I mentioned van pool already, um, neighborhood shuttles. So we're looking into all of these options and seeking to include those that would uh, work in Los Angeles and benefit communities here? So I answered your question. Uh, I would have to assume from what you said the answer is a no. You're not including Vision uh, Zero. So is, an is the question that is are Vision Zero principals and staff in David involved Summers. in our engagement effort? This is David Summers from the Department of Transportation. Sorry. Yeah, so if, if they've been involved in our engagement effort or internal engagement effort on developing a TDM program. Is, is that yes, is, is, is that being taken into consideration, or is it only a ways to to encourage carpooling, et cetera? So, so I, I, because I think it, it's possible some of those things may conflict at points along the way. Uh, Arthur Marm, if I can jump in from the planning department. Uh, yes, we will be, the work on the transportation Man management ordinance is going to be complementary to the work uh, occurring with the Vision Zero process. So really, the goal of the TDM ordinance is to really um, encourage multiple modes of transportation outside of the vehicle. And the goal of the Vision Zero is to really make our streets safer to ensure that there are 
uh, zero fatalities as a result of traffic collisions. So I think they really work um, in a complementary fashion. Okay. And uh, has the high injury network been updated with 2014 through 2016 data? That's more item. Yeah. We might not be able to uh, provide that response, but we'll. Maybe I in think the. I think the yeah. Hey, Nat Gale, uh, Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Yes, we have updated our high energy network with 2014 2015 data. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Martinez? Yeah. Um, so, what role does the transportation demand management policy play in considering um, traffic mitigations and new development projects? A good question, um, David Summers. Again. Uh, the, um, the, the role in terms of um, going, navigating through the entitlement process, um, as a part of our process, um, they'll pay the development uh, review fee, um, and that would incorporate, we would be needing to update that fee to capture some of the new responsibilities that we have um, as far as staff of monitoring and evaluating uh, the, the effect of this program, the efficacy. Um, so, so that will be, uh, have, have a role as far as the development fee that they pay as part of the application. Um, now, there may be options in the future that we're able to evaluate um, the, the impact of making off-site improvements, physical improvements in roadway space that, that a developer may be able to uh, contribute to as an option uh, that would be part of an optional measure in the TDM menu. Uh, and that, that could be uh, uh, fee-based uh, to, to pay for those improvements. But at this point, that's just only being explored so as an I, option. I guess I'm just explaining. So are you using the T, the, are the TDMs the primary consideration? Or are you viewing it after the capacity enhance, enhancements have already been exhausted? What comes first? Right. So the capacity enhancements. Because I feel like we need to move away from that. That we, we, we certainly are, yeah. So this is, this is really part of a broader effort that we have in evaluating transportation impacts where um, we, we are not going to be focused so much on, on ca capacity enhancements. It's not going to be a key feature of our development review program. We are shifting to looking at vehicle miles traveled, and that's partially why um, this is very timely in, in, in expanding the transportation demand management ordinance because it really highlights the features that are best uh, uh, addressing vehicle miles traveled from uh, the, the app from the site of that project so um, these are measures that just have high level of efficacy um, in addressing VMT and um, it would be part of a holistic development review process so so we would we would certainly prioritize this over capacity enhancement projects if we even continue to um, require those kinds of measures that have been done in the past so I just, I know it's going to be a very difficult paradigm shift for the entire city um, and, and getting right. especially our constituents to understand that we're not necessarily focused on relying on our cars for every single trip, but it'll be a difficult conversation. I just think everyone needs to also understand that accessing development is not going to be the same across our city, and that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. That's certainly appreciated, Council Member. We definitely are incorporating a context-sensitive approach in, our, in, in the formation of our program. I also think going forward, the, the, the more as we engage the public, we try to take this out of uh, the, the wonky and the acronyms, and it, that's very hard, um, and use some real life examples. Like I think the, the example of UCA is, uh, UCLA is a phenomenal example uh, of how uh, you can provide people uh, different options. Uh, people can get exactly where they want to go uh, in a way that 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 doesn't uh, increase congestion and actually can can ameliorate it. Uh, you know, in 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 the southern part of my district, folks certainly understand the example you talked about at Playa Vista, where uh, when that was approved under sort of the old standards, you know, they came up with a lot of creative ways to to give people an opportunity to do something other than 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 just getting into a car. And I think. We, I, I think people can intuitively grasp uh, 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 the, the importance of a big employer offering uh, uh, rideshare or uh, offering transit vouchers uh, to their employees, uh, you know, particularly as we build out the mass transit system. And I think people will embrace that. And I think particularly younger generation is going to be particularly enthusiastic to know that the 
the options that they're enthusiastic about are, are something that is going to be sort of more in the regular menu of what the, the city is recommending or incentivizing or requiring. Can I ask one more thing? Yeah. It just occurred to me, what level of coordination is happening between departments on the T, uh, DM strategies for new developments? Because we suck at coordinating. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think. I that's mean, there's no other. I mean, I could use another word, but we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, how are you guys doing that? I think that's a testament to why we're both here at the table. Um, transportation and city planning have been coordinating throughout this process um, from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, we plan to continue to do so because this programs that have an effective monitoring and evaluation component, which um, LADOT will is is here because they will be very much um, part of that. They will be leading that process. Um, so the programs that have an effective um, evaluation and monitoring portion are the most effective. So we've seen that in other cities, and we that's the way we're structuring, we, or we plan to structure the program. Uh, Arthi Varma with the planning department, just to add to what Ravina shared. We also have a working group uh, that meets, uh, I believe, monthly with the different relevant departments. So we use that, uh, that opportunity to gather to, to coordinate uh, the different uh, roles and responsibilities of the different departments. And the fact that there's three women at the table just means women make such great collaborators, right? And that's it. All right, great. Thanks. You're saying men suck at collaboration? I that? Say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're doing okay. Mr. Koretz. <laughs> yeah, one thing I'd like to add. So we have probably some of the biggest successes like UCLA in my district. We may also have some of the biggest failures like Century City in my district. Uh, I don't know how in the interim before we get the subway we can try and incorporate uh, uh, different major businesses and get them more involved in transit because we probably have one of the lowest transit uses there, which is part of why I fought so hard to have the subway station located in the heart of Century City because by nature, Century City uh, employees are not using a lot of transit. So we want to make it right in their face so it arrives right near all the office uses. Um, and people don't have to walk the extra long block from Santa Monica Boulevard because I think that'll make a difference for folks that are not intuitively involved. But if there's anything else that uh, uh, we might be able to work with, with DOT on, uh, we certainly encouraged uh, folks to use transit and haven't had that much luck thus far. Obviously, we're hoping that once there's the purple line going right in the heart of Century City, um, transit use will, will increase dramatically, but uh, uh, it has the longest way to go of uh, most places I'm aware of. I, I, the only thing I would just um, add to that, uh, thank you, Councilman, is, is, the, um, is that we're going to put a high premium on, uh, premium on evaluation. So the fact that um, if TDM programs that we're selecting uh, are performing well or they're not, we're going to have a very rich data set to draw from and be able to um, try new things, um, try things differently, and, and also have a means that which applicants have to engage the city on, on trying to um, improve the performance of the time. On the, uh, the working group that you mentioned, um, Department of Disability engaged? Uh, we don't believe that they are. I, I, I would recommend uh, in, in engaging Department of Disability and even Department of Aging. Uh, you know, I note that everybody engaged in this subject is nobody's a, nobody's a senior, uh, and, and we want to make sure that we're achieving mobility for everybody. And just having the perspective of people who are seniors and the disability community engaged in the discussion, I think, is helpful. Um, you know, as you go out and do the, the community engagement process, I'd encourage you uh, also not to do just neighborhood councils, which of course are foundational to our outreach approach, but also uh, AARP, uh, you know, uh, the, the various organizations around the city uh, engaged in the Vision Zero Alliance, whether it's LA Walks or Pacoima Beautiful or, or, or all the different uh, community organizations around the city. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, all right, so uh, without uh, objection, uh, this item is approved. Thank you. And that brings us to item number six. Item number six was continued from the February 14th meeting. Uh, this is an LADOT report in response to a Kokorian Rue Blumenfield motion relative to, develop, to developing a specific implementation strategy for the zero, uh, Vision Zero policy that reflects the goal of addressing all threats to the safety of the traveling public and related matters. Great. So, colleagues, you, you remember we discussed this at some length at the last meeting, and I asked that we continue it because I had a, a, a question about the intent of uh, the makers of the motion who were uh, establishing uh, criteria for uh, uh, Vision Zero priorities and uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, weren't uh, eliminating uh, the potential for equity being a, a, an important consideration. Uh, we checked with the makers of the motion and they were uh, fine with making sure that was included. DOT general manager said they, they took it to have been included in the language, but I wanted to make sure it was, was, was called out. There's uh, four recommendations and um, what I recommend is that we add to the fourth one uh, the fourth one currently says, in an effort to align the Vision Zero program with the city's parallel objectives of both reducing harm for the city's residents as well as achieving significant liability cost savings, the Vision Zero strategy should appropriate prior appropriately prioritize projects that address known threats to public safety. Um, I'd suggest, and the makers of the motion would be okay with this, uh, adding uh, with consideration given to severity, vulnerability, social equity, and cost effectiveness. Highlight social equity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any objection? Okay. So that so takes care of that. That takes care of that. Uh, so that is uh, approved with that amendment. And then that brings us to uh, our marquee item of the day. The LADOT. I'm going to read this one. Uh, item number eight. The LADOT report relative to the 2018 Vision Zero Action Plan and Progress Report. And what are you referring to, this handout or this one? This one? Uh, yes, yeah, so good afternoon. Nat Gale, uh, LEDOT. I will be uh, delivering a presentation that overviews the um, action plan, but you also have a copy uh, of the uh, printed action plan and progress report that is hot off the press uh, this morning. Uh, so we're very, very happy to be here. Um, and very excited for the, uh, this milestone. And let's um, introduce the whole cast here. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Tim Framo, DOT engineer. Lily O'Brien, LADOT. Okay, well, uh, as I mentioned, good afternoon, council members. It's great to be back. Good to see you all again. Um, I'm Nat Gale. I'm the division manager of the Vision Zero Division at LADOT, Los Angeles Department of Transportation. And I'm pleased to present an overview of the 2018 Vision Zero Action Plan and Progress Report. Um, it was a pleasure presenting to you two weeks ago on the data underpinning uh, much of this work, uh, but today we'll offer a snapshot of what we've done and what we plan to do to continue to improve safety on uh, Los Angeles streets. Before I go into the presentation, I did just want to take one moment to acknowledge all the staff, not just from LADOT, but from our partners at Public Works, City Planning, City Attorney's Office, Council Offices, Mayor's Office, et cetera, who contributed to this action plan, and I did want to specifically uh, acknowledge the two staff on our team, Timothy Black and Stephanie Dillon, who are the authors and designers of this document. It is beautiful, it is comprehensive, and they deserve all the credit for uh, the incredible work that went into that. I just wanted to acknowledge them. Uh, so today's presentation will cover a brief timeline for Vision Zero in Los Angeles, as well as our approach to project development. I'll touch on a few highlights from the 2017 progress report and strategies and actions uh, for the 2018 action plan to reduce deaths on our city streets. I did also want to call attention uh, to the fact that the action plan opens with a message from medical professionals. Um, medical professionals witness the human impact of traffic crashes every day in our trauma centers. Uh, traffic fatalities in Los Angeles are a public health crisis and it, they demand our attention. Uh, more people die on Los Angeles streets from traffic crashes than from gang violence every year in the city of Los Angeles. And we know that one death is one too many. Uh, we have made great strides in the city in reducing gang violence and violent crime. Uh, and attention and effort to traffic safety deserves a similar approach. 
and nothing highlights that more like our partners in uh, the Department of Public Health and the trauma centers who um, offered to give their voices to this document. So a quick recap of our Vision Zero timeline. In August 2015, Mayor Garcetti issued Executive Directive Number 10, establishing the Vision Zero initiative and an Executive Steering Committee uh, to oversee this work. In 2016, that Executive Steering Committee uh, oversaw a planning effort that included the detailed technical analysis that we presented uh, to you two weeks ago, um, and um, lots of different stakeholder focus groups and information to inform our first year of Vision Zero's actions. In January 2017, informed by this work, we published our first Vision Zero Action Plan, and 2017 was our first year of action. Um, that was also the time in which the Executive Steering Committee established 2016 as our baseline year to measure our actions against. Uh, from 2017 until 2025, uh, the end year of, the, of our desired goal, we will continue to iterate on program and project development and regularly report back to this body and, uh, and City Council on action items. Our project development approach for Vision Zero is iterative, informed by best practices, and data-driven. Uh, this chart details each step involved in developing new projects and programs and where we began uh, with our technical collision analysis and then uh, into our action plan for 2017, and how we take a phased approach to project delivery so that we can test and evaluate and iterate new traffic safety designs and concepts before projects are permanent. We are just beginning detailed design for some of the first Vision Zero projects that we tackled in 2017, as well as kicking off an ongoing approach to project and program evaluation. Uh, later in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned from uh, outreach and engagement and how committing to an engagement approach from the very beginning is uh, a core value of the Vision Zero approach moving forward. So what do we mean when we say different phases? Uh, in the first phase of Vision Zero projects, we look for cost-effective uh, which I appreciate the amending of the motion to include the language cost effective. Uh, improvements that can be made programmatically across our priority areas as well as citywide locations that qualify um, for different safety treatments with demonstrated crash patterns. This includes pedestrian yield paddle signs, high visibility crosswalks, etc. Phase two is a traffic signals program which involved more civil design and construction. And phase three is when we get to sustainable traffic safety through design, concrete street improvements that ensure our streets are safest for our most vulnerable road users. This involves much heavier civil design uh, to achieve the most long-term sustainable safety outcomes. So let's get into it. Some highlights from the 2017 Vision Zero Progress Report. First, one of the most important guiding principles for Vision Zero is the fact that we know speed kills. This principle informs our approach to design, it informs our approach to education and engagement, and informs our approach to enforcement. Uh, it's why this morning, Councilmember Bonin, Mayor Garcetti joined members of the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles uh, Department of Transportation to talk about um, the fact that our high injury network has enforceable speed surveys so that we can actually go out and get you know, the worst offenders when it comes to speeding on our streets. Uh, this is especially important for our population of children and seniors. This past weekend, Three people walking, aged 60 years or older, were killed in Los Angeles, two of whom were simply standing on the corner of Alvary, Alvarado and Beverly. We know that if we can take a targeted approach to speed management, these types of deaths can be prevented. So this is why for our targeted Vision Zero effort, we began by focusing on a small subset of the high injury network, our 40 priority corridors. Speed management is a corridor level issue. Uh, which is why uh, we took this approach. Of course, the Department of Transportation continues to focus on safety issues citywide, but this refined approach helped us as a team make targeted improvements. So what does that look like? Phase one, programmatic upgrades uh, along these priority quarters included uh, upgrading every crosswalk to high visibility, installing yield to pedestrian paddle signs that we know have proven to increase yielding behavior and lead to increased safety benefits. This was done on the priority corridors and at qualifying locations across the entire city. Phase two, uh, we have been successful in uh, designing and delivering seven pedestrian activated flashing beacons, which again, we know increase yield compliance and lead to safer outcomes. And we've worked closely with Public Works in this first year of Vision Zero on some phase three improvements, including seven pedestrian refuge islands uh, that give uh, you know, people crossing the street a spot to stop and wait uh, and be safe from uh, moving vehicles. A 
Additionally, 2017 saw the implementation of our first ever Vision Zero education campaign. We started with localized marketing and advertisements, including out of home, on um, billboards, bus benches, etc., as well as digital videos, radio ads, and a partnership with the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, in just three months, this campaign gained over 20 million impressions. We partnered that with on-the-ground community-based education. We funded eight creative traffic safety campaigns developed by community-based organizations and resulted in great partnerships with local communities, law enforcement, public health, and transportation. Survey results from this effort found that 80% of people expressed great concern about traffic safety and thought that the city should be investing in Vision Zero. We also saw a 20% increase in awareness and understanding of the Vision Zero principles after the campaign was complete. Now let's talk about some highlights of our approach in 2018. To quote our general manager, Salida Reynolds, 2018 is a year of action for Vision Zero. We will deliver safety projects across the city in the places that need it most. These projects will have a triple bottom line. They improve safety, they're cost effective, and they will help keep people moving across the city. Our first highlight involves $22 million in state funding to build traffic safety improvements at nine of our top 50 prioritized safe routes to school areas. These were funded in 24, as part of the 2014 State Active Transportation Program Cycle 1. Uh, and uh, that what you see on the screen is construction at Hollywood High, High School, uh, uh, which was, has some of the worst uh, traffic crashes uh, in the area. We additionally will conduct walking safety assessments at the remaining 41 of the top 50 schools uh, and, and pursue continued funding to build out those safety improvements for our school-aged children. Uh, it's worth highlighting that also in the Vision Zero Action Plan, we are taking what we've learned from the Safe Routes to School approach, and uh, per the comment earlier from uh, Council Member Bonin, focusing on our senior population and uh, developing a Safe Routes for Seniors program. Uh, and, and looking at the walking safety assessment and, and many of the partnerships that we've developed with the Los Angeles Unified School District and reaching out to the Department of Aging, AARP, other partners who are going to help um, develop a program and projects that will make sure that our senior population is safe as well. Our action plan also highlights a continued commitment to community engagement and previews the development of our public engagement strategy. This combines two ends of the engagement spectrum, public outreach, which is like an outstretched hand providing information to stakeholders, and community engagement, which invites community members to a seat at the table. This will provide project managers at LADOT and project stakeholders and a better understanding of the different approaches to engagement based on the different stage in project management and project development pipeline. Each different stage necessitates a different approach and will give us a language and a tool to communicate more effectively so people know where we are in our project process. Finally, it's worth highlighting that we'll continue to closely coordinate on integrated street reconstruction and Vision Zero. This is per direction from City Council and Mayor in this year's budget. Uh, the vision of this program is incredibly exciting. I walked through the phased approach to project development, how we go from phase one to phase two from phase three. The resources allocated under this integrated approach allow us to accelerate projects to that phase three concrete safety improvements, things like median islands, concrete curb extensions, more ped refuge islands. These are those sustainable design elements that will get us to our vision zero outcomes quicker uh, and, and, and let us meet, meet our goals. Uh, there is a separate CAO report that has been released that will be heard by this committee to discuss the details and scope and budget for this program. So next steps, uh, we will continue to focus on project evaluation. One of the key principles of Vision Zero is a continued uh, evaluation of what works. Um, it is worth highlighting that there is an industry best practice that dictates a minimum of two years of collision data to have a robust understanding of the safety performance of a given project. But we, of course, do ongoing regular project monitoring and evaluation with other metrics that we have uh, uh, easy access to, such as speed or compliance with a particular traffic control device. Uh, and those are important uh, aspects to the evaluation approach as well. For phase one, we are aiming to finish our programmatic phase one uh, up updates by the end of June 2018, and we would like to begin um, phase one improvements for a new round of priority project areas in July 2018. Of course, uh, we will be uh, pending what uh, is put together in the fiscal year 19 budget. For phase two, we're initiating design and beginning construction for 100 traffic signal uh, improvements. 
And for phase three, again, we will continue that coordination with Public Works on our complete streets delivery program. Those are some very high level snapshots. There's a lot of great information in this document. Today's a really exciting day. A lot of hard work from uh, everybody that I mentioned went into developing this and uh, the work continues. So happy to answer questions from the council members. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, let me thank you for the presentation and for the, the work that has happened over the past year. Uh, a lot of what we have done over the past year has been uh, small stuff, granular stuff, sort of you know what the mayor refers to as urban acupuncture. Uh, and there's been, uh, if you refer to it as urban acupuncture, there's been a lot of needles. Uh, 152 intersections. Uh, 109 crosswalks, 157 speed feedback signs. Uh, that's a lot of stuff to do in 365 days. Uh, that's pretty damn good. Uh, and um, I think that's even more impressive when you consider uh, how small your Vision Zero unit is and uh, how small really an understaffed DOT as a whole is. Uh, so kudos on that. I think that's, that's, that's really important. Um, I also want to highlight um, the fact that we're not where we want to be. You know, we're not at 20%. We wanted to be at 20%, and we're not. Uh, and the difference between where we wanted to be and where we are is, I believe, 42 lives. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, mentioning the pedestrians who were lost over the weekend, uh, because I believe that there were no homicides in the city over the weekend. And I think that's... Uh, that is a model uh, that, that we need to emulate. Uh, you know, this city used to have a horrible, horrible gang homicide problem. Any gang homicide is a huge tragedy and, 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 and a problem. But this city 20 years ago used to be much worse. And uh, it's much better now. Uh, and this morning we talked about enforcement. And enforcement was part of the way we uh, reduced gang homicides in Los Angeles. But... Uh, lots of other things were part of it. You know, whether it's gang intervention programs or job opportunities or educational opportunities. I mean, we, we tried in Los Angeles to create a, a different social and economic infrastructure. And you know, we, th this is about more than just the enforcement. This is also about the infrastructure. This really is, we, we say three E's, but uh, I agree with Tamika Butler, there's four E's. It's uh, education and enforcement and engineering, and it's also equity, because we're not going to fix this problem or the high injury network unless we do it on an equitable basis. Um, but you know, we the, the the stat that stood out for me, because you can look at the the stuff that was in the the paper this morning about overall stats, and you can see that as a, a statement about the scope of the problem. And there's some folks who have seen that and said, oh, Vision Zero isn't working. Uh, that's certainly not the, how I look at it. Uh, what that means to me is that we need to be doing more of Vision Zero. Uh, we haven't done a lot of it. We've done the executive order. We've done some planning. We've done some restriping. We haven't done a lot of big life-saving changes yet. And it indicates that we need to do it. This morning's stats were a, I think, a, you know, the, the, the trumpet was blaring that it's time for the city, this council, this next budget to get serious about the phase two and the phase three uh, concrete improvements. And we really, really need to do it. And I think part of what was interesting in the, the stats I've been seeing is that we had some improvement on our high injury network, which is huge, which tells me that where we're starting to do investments, we're starting to see the improvements that we want. So um, that is uh, a good thing. I think that's a, the, the path we need to, to keep going. Uh, I just wanted to note two things b before I shut up. One is... Um, I'm glad that in the last motion we worked out the compromise with the makers of the motion to include uh, not just equity but vulnerability because uh, there tends to be a lot of pedestrian blaming and victim shaming uh, when a pedestrian is killed. Oh, it's the pedestrian's fault. 
Yeah, pedestrians can be texting, and so are drivers. And uh, I think there's a greater responsibility to be careful from the person who is speeding in a huge mass of metal than there is for the woman who's trying to cross in a walker. Um, and so I think vulnerability is a very, very important criteria for us. Um, the, the other thing I want to be sure of is that that's, and, and this is a discussion with LAPD, is that the vulnerability consideration is also part of how we do enforcement. So when LAPD is enforcing, particularly if we're going to be asking for enforcement in the high injury networks uh, areas, that we're looking at the folks who are capable of doing the most harm from their behavior and not issuing tickets uh, to, uh, uh, you know, blanket tickets to, to jaywalkers. That's not how we're going to get out of this problem. Uh, we need to be looking at the, the whole problem. Final thing I just want to say is about education. I'm glad you mentioned it. I think you need to do more than, than, than is in here. I think if, if I've learned anything from the scars of the past year on Vision Zero is that one of the biggest problems we have with Vision Zero in Los Angeles is that it's very hard to solve a problem and get public buy-in for solving a problem when you haven't convinced people that the problem exists and how big it is. And I think most people in Los Angeles, when I speak to a community group, are shocked when they find out that there are more traffic fatalities than gang homicides. Uh, and I think they're shocked to find out how much we invest in reducing gang homicides and how little we invest in, in traffic fatalities. And I think we need to go much bigger than this. We need to get some celebrities doing PSAs. We need a spokesperson. We need to be getting uh, uh, some agencies and some foundations investing in an advertising campaign to educate people about the problem we're trying to solve. We're, we, we can do the engineering and the problem solving, but we need to convince people that there's a problem that needs solving. So um, that's my speech. Ms. Matrina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was lovely. Um, I have a ser series of questions, but I think that the, the part of the biggest issue we're having, I think we just are not serious about funding Vision Zero. So we can't just talk about it. We have to be about it. So I think that's the biggest issue and the biggest battle I think that we have is we like to talk about all these big plans and all these initiatives, but I don't think we've ever really gotten serious about funding this. And that for me is fundamentally what's wrong with this and why I feel so guilty is I don't think we've done a fair enough job to fund it correctly. But um, my question to you is, so the department wanted to have all the expired speed surveys and the city and all the city street design standards by 2017. So we did the speed surveys, those are completed. Where are we on the street design standards? Because you were supposed to do both by 2017. Unless I'm off. But so okay. we, have, we have been actively working on um, both our DOT internal standards and we, we've been working with our partners in Public Works um, to update their standards. So um, for example, how we qualified a new stop sign or a, a crosswalk, we've modernized that process and we've made it much more um, I guess I would just say easier to do it in the right way, which is stop signs generally, um, you know, were, were harder to qualify before. Now we have, we have updated the guidelines so it's easier to do more stop signs and we believe that can be very effective on neighborhood level. So For, how far away are we from getting our street design standards done? Uh, I think it's, it's just going to be an ongoing process because as we, once we update them, we'll have to go back and continue to want to make them better and better. It's a continual process but of that refinement. that was one of the goals to be done by 2017, correct? Yeah. Hi, I'm Bridget Smith. I'm the Chief of Staff for LADOT. I just thought I'd jump in here. Um, one of the important things that we did get accomplished, which has been really super critical, is moving away from our department's internal standards as being the only standard and making those guidelines and recognizing the NACTO guidelines and Caltrans and other um, important works that are, have been out there for a while, but kind of moving our paradigm away from having to recreate every um, great design document out there into an LADOT document. So Tim is talking about some of the guidelines we use to do certain things, but I just wanted to assure you all that we've taken a holistic approach that sort of opened up our toolbox so that we can make use of NACTO, which Caltrans has adopted, and other standards that help us guide. So all us those things work. are happening now? or they're, they're That's happened. Okay. That's already done. Okay. And um, 
Why are we reassessing the installation of the concrete pedestrian islands? Why are we doing that? What is the purpose of the device? No, why are we reassessing our installation of the concrete pedestrian island? Oh, I, th I think you're referring to in the, in the benchmarks, yeah, the, it says the reassess. Back, the reassess of those um, concrete pedestrian. That's what you call them, right? Concrete pedestrian islands? Why yes. are you reassessing those? Um, maybe that was a, um, a misstatement. Um, evaluating their effectiveness is, is something that we want to just make sure we have our own local documentation of um, so we were supposed to complete how many of these? What was the goal? We have, a, we have 29 locations that we've designed. Um, Bureau of Street Services has been installing them for us. Um, they've installed, I think, seven. seven of them. And so we're looking... Seven of the 20... Nine. 29. Nine? That's okay. correct. And, um, but 29 is not the end all. Those were just the initial batch. So we... Uh, so it's not that we're stopping because we, so it's not a That's lack correct. of money. What is it? So it's, it's, is it just that we can't get them done fast enough or we just haven't funded them? What is, uh, reassessing to me means some sort of, we're stalling for whatever reason. I just want to know why. I, I'm not sure why the word reassess was yeah. used in the document, okay. but where we are right now is we are, the, the remaining locations, we are going to find a way to build them. We, we, we are confident we'll be able to do that in this fiscal year. Yeah. So we're not this stopping. This fiscal year, in well, three months. This the next fiscal year. Fiscal the next year. fiscal year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. It's coming. <laughs> this coming fiscal year. Yes. yes. All right. Um, the other question I had, so in your action plan, uh, it, in your report, it also notes that, um, that you're also reassessing, here's this word again, reassessing the pursuit of, the, of creating a vision plan integration fund for new development along the high injury network. Why are we doing that? Yes, I, I see. Um, you're referring to the different goals in the in the back of the document. Yes. So, so the term reassess uh, is um, meant to signal to that executive steering committee that those are items that need to be um, coordinated better, um, revisited at the the steering committee. So, for for the pedestrian refuge island to really understand what the delivery challenge is in how those are being constructed and to the um, the funding mechanism uh, we need to so there is a funding mechanism to, to, this, to this there has been work that has been done to develop that but we need to come together and actually begin to bring that as a, a policy direction to members of the City Council so is that due to lack of funding or you're just no it's just due, uh, due to lack of um, it, it, it is in progress, is what I would say. Did you have something to add? You look like you want to speak. Is that word again, reassessing? Yeah. It just makes it seem like there's a delay and there isn't, there isn't a reason or an explanation as to why we're, we're doing that. Good afternoon. Dan Mitchell with the Department of Transportation. Uh, to, uh, just addressing that one item about new development, we have modified our uh, traffic study guidelines to include the high injury network as one of the considerations so that additional measures are So that taken. work's been done? Yes. I, perhaps that particular item hasn't been completed in its entirety, but I can tell you that we've made significant progress. Okay. Got it. I understand. Uh, and the last question I have is what are our legislative priorities in Sacramento and who's carrying the, um, we talked about this at one of our meetings, Mr. Chair, who's carrying our speed survey legislation. Remember we were looking for an author? Laura Where are we Friedman. out on that? Huh? Laura Friedman. Is it Laura Friedman? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. And it's underway. She's introduced the bill and... Jennifer Cohen, LADOT Government Affairs. Yes, she has introduced a bill and we're working with her staff on um, fine-tuning the language to get exactly what we want to. Um, I think that there is general sentiment that the speed setting methodology is inadequate. The solution isn't as obvious. Um, but giving cities more tools um, it is pretty clear that that's a priority. Councilmember Coretz has been very involved in that discussion as well. And what is what are our legislative priorities in Sacramento? So the um, issues that we brought, we sent to the CLA and um, to the mayor for that our priorities were um, one for handicap placard reform, which the council approved last year. So it basically it was a continuation of the um, legislative priorities that the council approved last year. We didn't bring anything new. So it's placard reform, it's a speed setting methodology. Um, and we didn't bring anything new because we didn't find an author? Or no, because we still had priorities from the previous year that we hadn't that accomplished. Okay, got it. Okay. That's okay. One thing we do call out in the um, action plan to uh, track is um, other cities' efforts on automated speed enforcement. 
uh, which is currently uh, illegal in the state of California, and the um, cities of San Francisco and San Jose are pursuing a pilot program. Um, and that is something that we are monitoring to watch its effectiveness and how they roll out that program. Um, and it's definitely a tool in the Vision Zero toolbox we are interested in. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Chris. And I remember uh, Sheila Kuehl was the first one to bring that kind of legislation forward. And uh, I think on behalf of uh, the city of Beverly Hills in particular, and it went down in flames, but it was a statewide program and that was probably a little bit too big a bite. So if we can do it as a pilot program, I, I think that'll work great. Okay. And, and on the speed surveys, I'm not sure what the criteria is, but obviously we need to find a criteria that excludes relatively deserted rural highways, which I think was the target in the first place. So population or density, there's got to be some angle that picks up the, the solution. Because in, in my area, people didn't want to increase from 35 to 40 miles an hour partly because of exactly what you pointed out here. You get to 40 miles an hour, you have a, a very high incidence of death. So you don't really want the average law-abiding citizen to be driving 40 miles an hour. So anyway, we can, we can drop that. Um, I think my concerns are generally not with what we're doing in the high injury networks, because I think we have a clear path and, and some, some obvious actions and I think the number of fatalities and injuries will drop once we start implementing those. Um, my concerns are generally the areas that are not in the high injury networks I think may continue to go up particularly because of um, bad practices partly by pedestrians. Uh, certainly the number of pedestrians that I see crossing uh, against green lights with oncoming traffic and not even looking. Um, I see a lot in, in my own neighborhood in particular, particularly near hotels with out-of-town visitors that don't know that we're trying to improve our traffic safety and uh, they'll literally cross without looking and I'll, I'll be going 30 miles an hour and suddenly they'll cross uh, against the red. Um, I don't know how we can uh, more aggressively get the message out and enforce. I actually think that kind of jaywalking in certain areas where it's prevalent probably should be enforced. Now whether you step off once the, the don't walk 20 seconds left sign goes on and you know you can make it in 15 seconds, I think that's probably a stretch and doesn't really help anyone but people actually crossing against the red with oncoming traffic, um, where that's a frequent problem, I think we should look at, at some greater enforcement. Um, also, I don't know if there are ways to, to uh, do more outreach on some of the safety elements um, without just focus, focusing it on the high entry networks, but doing some some better marketing on some of the worst practices of both drivers and uh, and pedestrians, and I don't know how much we've we've looked at at that element and what the cost-effective ways to do that are. Yeah. Um, where where are we on that? In yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, in this um, budget this year, we were funded for um, about. $800,000 in education and engagement, and we're bringing a contractor on to help develop citywide marketing materials that help uh, accomplish exactly what you uh, have stated there, um, raising awareness about new traffic safety tools as well as be best behavioral practices. And so we're um, working on that effort right now. And can we do commercials that we ask uh, television stations to run free of charge? Uh, you know, those kinds of, of uh, public messaging. Yeah, this is Lily O'Brien with LADOT again. And we are exploring all of those options. We've already started to develop some video content that explains how to use some of our newer um, safety improvement uh, countermeasures. And so um, we're looking at ways to, you know, promote those videos on social media and on the real estate that we have on our dash buses. So 
sort of exploring all options and I think when we have a contractor on board to help us navigate some of the free um, and earned stuff that uh, that is out there in LA I think we can put a pretty effective campaign together yeah and the the statistic that concerns me the most is that if you're going 20 miles an hour you have an 80 percent chance of surviving and 40 miles an hour you have a 10 percent and I think we do have conflicting goals because at, in, in one sense we're trying to figure out with, with a lot of our mobility planning how do we keep traffic flowing well if traffic's flowing at 35 to 40 miles an hour we are guaranteeing that pedestrians that get hit um, are very likely to die so how do, how do we uh, keep those two sort of conflicting goals from actually conflicting. Dan Mitchell again from LADOT. So I just wanted to highlight that that is the impact speed, not necessarily the speed limit, right? right. So, so it's the impact speed and our goal is to have drivers aware of the environment so that they have the time to react and slow down and stop, hopefully before a collision happens. But if it does happen, it happens at very low speed. It's when it happens without awareness that you have a full speed collision and that's when people die. So that, that's really the focus of that statistic. But obviously the more people going 35 and 40 miles an hour, the greater likelihood that they find themselves in that situation. Clearly if all our speed limits were 20 miles an hour, we would you know, be, 80% of the way towards resolving all of our problems. If everyone drove that speed, that's yeah. true. But uh, the, the focus is, I, I don't think that that's, it, it's not that we need to slow every driver down to 20 miles an hour. It, it's really that we need to create an environment, uh, a street design that supports all road users and that generates the awareness so that when unexpected incidents happen, they, the actual, an actual collision would happen at low speed and people survive those crashes. So they're less unexpected. So That's right. Correct. So people more, are crossing or at least are visible. And if you're not able to, to avoid it, at least you, you engage in that activity at, at a low speed. So the collision isn't as, as likely to be deadly. Exactly. Understand. Thank you. Where do you drive, Mr. Kurtz? I'm just curious. Um, well, I do a lot of driving on Beverly Boulevard from uh, where I live straight to uh, City Hall. <laughs> it, Beverly Boulevard um, and Alvarado was where those two gentlemen were struck and killed. And where I see uh, specifically a, a lot of, of pedestrians that cross in a, uh, in a way that makes me wonder if they have a death wish is right outside the Orlando Hotel. Um, at Orlando and 3rd Street. And, you know, I've had close calls myself not driving at unusually high speeds, but when people step out and you have a very narrow street with one lane in each direction, you don't necessarily have a lot of time to, to break or any kind of warning. So I would like to see uh, greater enforcement in, in situations like that where we do have a lot of uh, people violating that one dangerous element. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of uh, public comment cards. Uh, uh, Lindsay Nolan and uh, Farah Mars. Nat, stay put in case there's some questions from sure. you. Lindsay, go ahead. Hello, my name is Lindsay Nolan and I'm with LA County Bicycle Coalition. While we're pleased at some of the successes in this report, it lacks measurable goals. Why does a data-driven approach to traffic safety has, have such vague benchmarks for 2018, such as focusing on phase two improvements? How can we hold city officials accountable for improving traffic safety if it's unclear what they hope to achieve this year? The benchmark section also says that the city continues to conduct meetings with the bike community and assist in its bicycle plan efforts. What does this mean and how are we on track? Which bicycle community are we talking about? We also find it 
contradictory that the Vision Zero Alliance is listed as a partner, even though it was essentially uninvited from the city's core team meetings. Finally, we find the enforcement highlights very troubling. The report notes a 27% increase in speeding tickets, but if we don't have an explicit no racial profiling pledge, how do we know that these are being issued in equity? issued equitably and not leading to continued over-policing. Similarly, the $5 million grant to LAPD includes bike ped count details and distracted driving details. What communities and behaviors are being targeted? We need more transparent data to hold the city accountable to its commitment to equity. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Farah Mares. I'm a constituent of Councilmember Coretz in the neighborhood of Encino, and I would like to speak in support of uh, the continuation of Vision Zero and also to ensure that there are clear, measurable goals, uh, as the previous speaker said. Um, I also want to echo what Councilmember Coretz said with respect to uh, making sure that there isn't uh, a conflict. Um, I, I, I had to help my grandparents when their neighbor was killed in a marked crosswalk on White Oak and Margate, right where the bike lane is, because there was a driver who tried to uh, cut on the right through a bike lane to pass uh, traffic. Um, Vision Zero affects all parts of the city of Los Angeles. And yes, we have a lot of frustration about the amount of traffic that we face. But um, as you said, we also need to make sure that we don't have a continued increase in deaths. Thank you. Thank you. Nat, anything you want to respond to? Nat, anything you want to respond to? Um, yes, uh, I would like to say that uh, the Los Angeles Department of Transportation has uh, made itself available uh, to the Vision Zero Alliance. Um, to continue to make sure that we engage uh, honestly and earnestly um, in that relationship. Um, and uh, I take the, the comments to heart about um, continuing to identify measurable benchmarks. Uh, in, and we'll look forward to a regular annual update of this action plan and um, progress report that incorporates uh, those comments. Um, all right. I'd like to... Uh, uh, pull together a meeting with Vision Zero Alliance and, and DOT just to, that every relationship should be getting stronger, um, not strained. So I want to do a little marriage counseling maybe. Sure. Um, I have a question. Uh, what is the, the demographics or the, di what's the diversity in the Vision Zero Alliance? Mm. Demographically and eth eth ethnicity wise, what is the makeup of their membership? Um, at, at this point, I don't. Okay. The Vision Zero Alliance is a, is a, a um, coalition of community-based organizations and members of the general public who have organized around this effort that are growing every day. Um, I'm not aware of the, or I, I'm not informed, I should say, on, as to the demographics of the, the coalition. Uh, I don't know. No, but we can ask. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Amelia Carr of Los Angeles Watts. Um, uh, come on up, your phone, please. Come on up. Good afternoon. Amelia Crotty with Los Angeles Walks. We convene the Vision Zero Alliance. And as Nat um, said, it's, an it's a coalition of about 23 organizations from across the city, though I would say we don't have any organizations representing the Valley. I know. Uh, right. <laughs> and um, we are always looking for new organizations, but with these community-based organizations, they're so tapped out in terms of capacity that it's just hard to get people involved and just to add to their workload. Um, we are always open to working with council members to identify, or neighborhood councils, any stakeholders to identify groups that are willing to join on. Thank you for asking. Uh, let me ask about the measurable goals part. Um, we have the 2017 progress report, um, benchmarks, partners, goal, status. Um, how are we going to do that for 2018? What do we measure against for 2018? Um, I, I would be very delighted to bring back a, a presentation to go over exactly what we'll be looking at to measure in 2018 to this council committee. I mean, are you guys waiting to see what the hell we do in terms of funding before you can, is that, <laughs> you can speak yes. bluntly? Uh, yes, we certainly um, rely on the annual city budget to know uh, what it is that we can build, uh, what it is that we can design, what it is we can deliver on. 
So as we head into the city budget process, can you, um, you'd get in trouble if you did this of your own volition, so I'm asking for it. Uh, can you um, prepare uh, for us um, uh, stuff that you could do and what the price tag would be so that, we're, so that when we get into the discussion about what the Vision Zero allocation should be uh, in the budget, I'm just not arguing for a number. Sure. I'm arguing for, well, if we want to do this many curb cuts or this many, uh, 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 you know, phase two or this many phase three, there's something attached to it. Um, yes. Absolutely. Be happy to prepare that information. Uh, and I would suggest that the first element in that should be um, anything that is marked under the 2017 status as reassessing. And the way I read reassessing, I'm glad Ms. Martinez pointed that out, is um, uh, re reassessing was a uh, polite way of saying it isn't done yet. Um, what, where, where you're reassessing it, is, is reassessing whether or not the 2017 goal is something we could part. accomplish. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you you weren't so much reassessing whether you wanted to do it. You were reassessing when you could get it done. Right. Right. Because right. it didn't get done in 2017. Right. Um, right. So you know, 25 concrete pedestrian islands. We've already committed to that, so we absolutely have to be doing that. In the, in the next round of budget. So not all of it is, you know, financial and infrastructure-wise for the reassessing, but um, that, would, that would be good. And because um, we need to be able to have something to measure against next year. I think uh, Lindsay was right when she, when she brought up that point. And it's, it's going to be a, 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 an, an empty budget discussion if we don't have something. So. Um, I'm asking for something so that we can have that. Great. Got it. Okay. Um, anything else? Nope. All right. So uh, without objection, that is approved. Excellent meeting. Thank you. Is there anything else? We're done? Rough start, but we got that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, council members. Thank you very Thank much. You we are adjourned. Sorry, that's the start. What was that?